In lab 11, we're going to be looking at viruses and more specifically bacteriophages, which are viruses that only infect bacteria. Now, first of all, let's talk a little bit about viruses in general. Viruses are infectious agents that have both living and non-living characteristics. As far as living characteristics, viruses do reproduce at a rather fantastic rate, but we have to qualify that only in living host cells. And viruses can mutate. That's another living characteristic. As far as non-living characteristics of viruses, they are acellular. That is, they're not composed of cells. They contain no cytoplasm, no cytoplasmic membrane, no cellular organelles. They carry out no metabolism on their own. They must replicate using the host cell's metabolic machinery. So viruses don't have ribosomes to make proteins. They have no way to make energy. They have to use the host cell's metabolic machinery. All the virus does is provide the genetic instructions to the host cell of how to make viruses. So they turn the host cell into a factory for manufacturing viruses. So viruses, unlike cells, don't grow and divide. Instead, new viruses and viral parts are synthesized inside the host cell and then assemble to produce intact viruses. And with few exceptions, viruses possess DNA or RNA or both. Now, viruses are almost always much smaller than bacteria because they don't have to be cells. They are submicroscopic. That is, we can't see them with a conventional light microscope, but we can see them with an electron microscope. And most range in size from between 10 and 250 nanometers. And remember, a nanometer is one one billionth of a meter or 10 to the minus nine meters. And structurally, of course, viruses are much simpler than bacteria because again, they're not cells. Now, every virus, first of all, contains a genome of single-stranded or double-stranded DNA or RNA, and that functions as the genetic material for the virus. This is usually surrounded by a protein shell called a capsid, and that's usually composed of identical protein subunits called capsomeres. And many viruses are nothing more than nucleic acid and a capsid, in which case they're called nucleocapsid or naked viruses. Now, many animal viruses have an envelope that surrounds the nucleocapsid. And so if there's an envelope surrounding the nucleocapsid, we call that an enveloped virus. And we'll be talking about viruses and especially animal viruses like those that infect humans later on in unit four in lecture. But what we're going to deal with today are specifically bacteriophages. And bacteriophages are viruses that only infect bacteria. In this electron micrograph, we see a cross-section of a bacterium, and these are all viruses that are being produced and assembling inside. There we see the capsid with the genome inside and the tail of the virus that we're using that uh, is in this particular bacterium. So the bacterium becomes a factory for manufacturing viruses from scratch. Now, some of them are rather complex, uh, like the one we're using today. Uh, for example, figure one shows you the virus we're using today in lab called colophage T4. So this is a bacteriophage or virus that only infects E. coli, Escherichia coli. It consists of a protein shell or capsid, and inside of that is the genome of the virus, which is double-stranded DNA in this case. There's no cytoplasm in there, no organelles. Now this virus has a rather complex tail structure that we see down here. It looks kind of like an Apollo lunar landing module when you look at it. It has a contractile sheath and it has these tail fibers that adsorb to receptors on the cell wall of E. coli. Once it adsorbs, a contractile sheath contracts and that drives a hollow protein tube into the cytoplasm of the bacterium and the virus injects its genome into the bacterium. So the only thing really entering the bacterium is the genome of the bacteriophage. 
And this is an electron micrograph of colophage T4 that we're using today. There's the capsule filled with DNA, there's a contractile sheath and the base plate. Now, since viruses lack organelles and they're totally dependent on the host cell's metabolic machinery for replication, we can't grow them in a synthetic medium in a lab like we do bacteria. Because again, they have nothing to replicate with. They require living host cells in order to replicate. So in the lab, animal viruses can be grown in animals, but they're very species specific. So they usually only infect a specific animal. A few of them, like the influenza viruses, can be grown in embryonated eggs. But the majority of viruses, when we grow them in the lab, we grow in what's called cell culture. And in a cell culture, the host animal cells are grown in a synthetic medium. And then those cells are infected with viruses. So when we grow viruses in the lab, we're usually infecting cells with the virus and harvesting the virus from those cells. And of course, bacteriophages would be grown in susceptible bacteria as the host cell. Now the virus we're using today called colophage T4 replicates by what's called the lytic life cycle. So named because the virus will lyse the bacterium after it assembles in order to get out and infect new bacteria. So a virus that replicates by the lytic life cycle is called a lytic bacteriophage. And we need to understand the lytic life cycle of the virus we're using today, colophage T4, to understand the results we'll be looking at. Now we'll go through the life cycles of viruses later on in lecture in unit four, but we do need to go through the life cycle of this bacteriophage today. And the first step in any virus life cycle is called adsorption. And that's attachment of sites on the bacteriophage tail absorbing two receptor sites on the cell wall of the E. coli today. And in this animation, we can see the adsorption step of the lytic life cycle of colophage T4. So the tail fibers on the virus, the colophage T4, will fit receptors on the cell wall of E. coli. And these are very specific, as we'll see later on. A specific bacteriophage can only infect a specific strain of bacterium. So here we see the adsorption where the tail fibers absorb to receptors on the cell wall of the E. coli today. So that's called adsorption. The next step in the virus life cycle is called penetration. And here a bacteriophage enzyme that's usually a part of its base plate drills a hole in the bacterial cell wall enzymatically. And as the contractile sheath on the tail contracts, the bacteriophage injects its genome into the cytoplasm of the bacterium. And that begins what we call the eclipse period, the period when no intact bacteriophages are seen within the bacterium. Because at this point, the virus is simply a genome of the virus inside the bacterium. So we see penetration in the second animation. So the virus has absorbed to receptors on the cell wall of the E. coli. Enzymes will enzymatically drill a hole in the cell wall. As this contractile sheath contracts, that drives a hollow protein tube, much like a hypodermic needle, into the cytoplasm of the bacterium, and the virus will inject its genome. In this case, the genome of this virus is double-stranded DNA. So that's the penetration where only the genome of the bacteriophage enters the host bacterium. Following penetration, we have replication of the virus. So enzymes coded for by the bacteriophage genome shut down the bacterium's macromolecular synthesis. They shut down the bacterium's protein synthesis, RNA synthesis, and DNA synthesis. And the bacteriophage genome then replicates maybe 50 to 100 times uh, inside the cytoplasm of the bacterium. And then the virus uses the bacterium's metabolic machinery, its ribosomes, its transfer RNA, its energy, and its nutrients to synthesize uh, bacterial phage structural components that will become parts of the virus and the enzymes needed to assemble the virus. So here we see replication in this animation. 
So there's the genome that entered the virus. It's going to replicate by complementary base pairing, adenine pairing with thymine, guanine with cytosine, until it produces usually between 50 and 100 copies of the virus, although the number can vary. Following genome replication, the viral genome, the DNA, can be transcribed into viral messenger RNAs. So the red here represent the messenger RNAs being transcribed off the viral genome. Once the messenger RNA is made, the bacterium's ribosomes attach to the viral messenger RNA and translate the viral messenger RNA into various viral proteins. Structural proteins that form parts of the virus, like the capsid, the tail, etc., and enzymes that will be needed to put the virus eventually together. So replication is really making viral parts within the host cell using the bacterium's metabolic machinery to synthesize the viral parts. The next step is maturation. And maturation are the bacteriophage parts assemble around the genome, producing intact viruses once again, as we see in this animation. So we've seen that the genome is replicated here. I've only shown a few molecules of the genome so that we can see it better in the animation. And as the various structural components of the virus are made, they will assemble around the viral genome, producing intact bacteriophages. So as we see, the bacterium has become a factory for manufacturing viruses from scratch, bacteriophages. Following maturation, the next step is release of the virus from the host cell. So in this case, a bacteriophage coated lysozyme breaks down the bacterium's peptidoglycan causing osmotic lysis of the bacterium. And as the bacteria burst, the intact bacteriophages are released as we see in this step. So the virus has assembled, maturation, lysozyme starts breaking down the bacterial peptidoglycan in the cell wall, causing osmotic lysis of the bacterium. And as the bacterium lyses, the viruses are dumped out. And those are intact bacteriophages now that can now reinfect other bacteria. And anywhere from 50 to 200 bacteriophages may eventually be produced and they then infect surrounding bacteria. So in today's lab, we're gonna be infecting the bacterium Escherichia coli B with a specific bacteriophage called colophage T4. That's our virus, colophage T4. And in the first lab, we're gonna be looking for plaques. Now a plaque we define as a small clear area on an agar plate where the host bacterium has been lysed as a result of the lytic life cycle of the infecting bacteriophages. So as the bacteria replicate on the agar surface, they form a lawn of bacterial growth, but each bacteriophage that adsorbs to a bacterium during the lab will reproduce and lyse that bacterium then the released bacteriophages will infect neighboring bacterial cells and they will lyse, and those bacteriophages will, infecting, will infect neighboring bacteria and they will lyse, and eventually we see a visible self-limiting area of lysis, which we call a plaque. The second part of the lab is gonna demonstrate what we call viral specificity. And viral specificity means that a specific strain of bacteriophage will only adsorb to and infect a specific strain of susceptible host bacterium. So the bacteriophages are very specific as to what organism they can infect and replicate within. And so a bacteriophage adsorbing to a bacterium is just as specific as an enzyme fitting a substrate or an antigen fitting an antibody. So because of that viral specificity, we can sometimes use that as another tool to help identify unknown bacteria. And we call this phage typing. So phage typing is where we use known bacteriophages, viruses, to identify unknown bacteria by whether or not that virus is able to infect and lyse that bacterium. 
And this is sometimes used in identifying strains of bacteria like Staphylococcus aureus, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, species of Salmonella. Uh, for example, we can use a series of known Staphylococcal bacteriophages against Staph aureus isolated from a given environment. And then one can determine uh, if it's identical or different from the strain of the Staphylococcus aureus isolated from the lesion or from the food and thereby determine uh, the source of the infection and the route of transmission. So the first part of the lab is a plaque count, and this is a very complex lab. You had some videos on how to pipette and procedures for that. Now, because this is more complex, uh, I'm going to use a video on YouTube that Dr. Kelly Hovis, our other microbiologist here at CCBC, made uh, as part of the virtual labs that we did during the COVID-19 spring semester. And she goes through the whole procedure step by step and you get to watch her doing the procedure that you will be doing. So that'll be a nice way to review what you'll be doing in lab that day. But again, don't forget to look the videos on how to use the pipette, how to read the pipette and such. And then the second part of the lab is viral specificity. And again, I'm going to use uh, Dr. Hovis's video that she made on viral specificity so you can see exactly how that part of the lab is done. Then after you incubate your plates, next time we're going to be looking for plaques on the plate. Uh, we're going to be plating out three different dilutions of the colophage T4 and be looking at the plates uh, to determine or to recognize plaques. Now we're not going to actually count the plaques. We're not trying to, trying to determine the number of viruses in the sample in this case. We just want to see what plaques look like. So if we look at this Petri plate here, you see these small, uh, what look like dark gray areas. Each one of those is a plaque where the E. coli, the gray growth all over the plate here, has been lysed by bacteriophages. Initially, one bacterium was infected. Uh, the viruses released from that infected neighboring bacteria, they were lysed. Those viruses infected surrounding bacteria, they were lysed. And eventually see these self-limiting clear areas of lysis where the light gray E. coli has been lysed by the virus. And you can see the dark uh, tabletop underneath where there's no bacteria growing. So that's what the plaques look like. And again, uh, depending on the dilution of the virus, notice this plate has many more plaques on it because there, that was a more concentrated uh, viral dilution plated out of that plate. But again, each one of these little clear circular areas is a plaque. So on the practical, you should recognize plaques if I show you a plate like this and know what caused them to appear, namely the lysis of the bacterium by the bacteriophages. And then in the second part of the lab on viral specificity, we streaked four different gram-negative bacteria on four different sectors of a Petri plate, where the circles indicated uh, I added a drop of concentrated colophage T4. Now remember, colophage T4 will only infect E. coli, causing it to lyse. So you'll notice here that the E. coli has been lysed in all of this area by the virus bacteriophage T4 or colophage T4. Colophage T4 had no effect on the other bacteria because of viral specificity. That virus can only infect strains of E. coli. So we can tell in this case that number two must be E. coli because it was lysed by the known virus colophage T4. So again, in this experiment, we we're using a known virus colophage T4 to identify an unknown bacterium, which of the four was E. coli. And again, you should be able to interpret that on a practical, be able to tell me which bacterium is Escherichia coli if I tell you that a drop of known colophage T4 was added where the circles are. And of course, always at the end, you have your performance objectives. Uh, in the in uh, soft chalk introduction to this lab, uh, found on your Blackboard site. Uh, you will see that some of these objectives can be crossed out, so you're only responsible for the ones I tell you you're responsible for uh, in your lab section on your learning management system. 
And again, on the practical, you should recognize plaques and state their cause and interpret the results of viral specificity using the known virus colophage T4. And as always, we have a self-quiz with answers at the end.